Our next speaker is Ben Rubin. Ben is a staple of this course. He's been doing this for a long period of time. And he's uh, the master of the physical exam. And Ben is from uh, right up the coast here in Orange County. So without further ado, Ben Rubin. Good morning. As, as always, it's a pleasure to be here participating in the course. Um, well, I think the gigabyte part is over and the special effects for the morning are, are pretty much over. Can we go to the beginning of the talk, Alan, instead of the middle? There we go. Thanks. Well, Jim's asked me to spend some time talking about um, a couple of practical things that I use in the office. And first, in the way of disclosure, I have financial uh, relationships with LineMed and Northrex, and neither of which will be involved in this talk. So the question that, that I have to answer really is, what can't I learn by getting an MRI or doing an arthroscopy or an exam under anesthesia? Because we're all very busy, we don't have a lot of time to, to spend with patients in the office, and you want to just uh, get an answer and, and move on. Well, the answer to this question is, I can't learn anything about function from, it, from out, being outside of the office. We know that function is determined by anatomy, physiology, kinematics, and ultimately the biomechanics as a result of the influence of all of those, and that was just beautifully pointed out by Giovanni. So my, I want my exam to be a functional exam, and I want to try to identify the functional deficits and by doing so, I want to identify the mechanical flaws, which ultimately will result in tissue failure, and then get the patient to present as they do with pain and dysfunction, because that's what the patient comes to you with, is either pain or an inability to do what they want. Well, you heard yesterday that the, uh, the analogy was a golf ball on a tee, um, and that, that we heard from the people from Boston, and that's pretty classic, and that assumes that the joint uh, functions in isolation. But in the early 80s, Carter Rowe, also from Boston, talked about the function of the shoulder being the way a sea lion balances a ball on his nose, and there's a coordinated movement of the scapula which keeps the humeral head centered. And you just saw that in Giovanni's talk as well. And so it's very important to evaluate the scapula in order to be complete in examining the shoulder. Well, this is an electromagnetic tracking study done by Phil McClure of Arcadia University in Philadelphia, and he was kind enough to let me use it. If you watch the video that's going to play, you'll see that what the scapula does as it comes up is it upwardly rotates, externally rotates, and posterior tilt, posteriorly tilts. When we talk about protraction and retraction, those are combination movements. That's a combination of movements along various axes. These are the pure axes. So if you watch the arm come up, the scapula elevates, externally rotates, and then posteriorly tilts. And what that does is it allows for clearance in the subacromial space. When you look at an injured thrower, they lose external rotation control of the scapula. They don't, can't, usually can't elevate their shoulder as much, and they lose posterior tilt. And what you see on the exam is medial scapular border winging, which we describe as scapular dyskinesis. And in Ben Kibler's lab, what they've shown is if you identify scapular dyskinesis, which is an abnormal movement pattern of the scapula, you are probably 84% accurate. So if you see it, it's probably real. And those throwers come to us with impingement symptoms, labral injuries, partial cuff injuries. But ultimately, in a high-level picture, they're going to come in and say, I don't have as much on the ball, or I can't put the ball where I want to. So that leads us to our functional exam. We, want, we know that, um, that altered uh, anatomy, physiology, and kinematics can be identified as mechanical flaws. And the easiest way to identify them, to be honest, in the shoulder is to take an accurate history. More than any other joint in the body, my feeling is that in at least 90% of the cases, I can make a diagnosis based on the history. Um, you want to, in following the history, the history will lead you to doing a functional exam that is efficient. You don't have to look at everything in every patient. Um, but you want to look at alignment. You want to get a feel for their core strength and stability. Clearly, you want to look at scapular thoracic kinematics. I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And thinking about muscle imbalances and um, what's long, what's short, what's, uh, what's weak, what's strong, and, um, and what's the range of motion. And ultimately, that means you're going to be looking at the entire kinetic chain. So when we take a history from a thrower, and I'm going to uh, be examining one of Jim's patients, and I basically went through this history with his father uh, over the phone. Um, and I want to know when did he start pitching, when did he start throwing curveballs and other stuff. 
Um, how much has he thrown? How much does he throw now if he's capable of throwing now? Um, pitch counts, uh, rest between outings, previous injuries. And if we're thinking of the entire kinetic chain, ask your athletes, did they ever sprain their ankle? Because the throw, if you think about it, the first muscle that contracts when a right-handed thrower is throwing is the left calf muscle, which calf muscles which push against the ground to create a joint reaction force so the pitcher can start to rock back. So the, the legs become important. So I look at postural alignment, and I look at, I want to look at the patient from the front, side, and back. I want to think about what's the position of their head relative to their body, their shoulders, their scapulae. I want to look at their uh, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, look at their pelvis, and I want to just get a feel, just eyeballing them. And let's look at this young lady, and um, she's got pretty darn good posture because she's a yoga instructor. The thing I want to point out from the front is the clavicle should make about a 20 degree angle. That, will t that way you can orient and know which shoulder is too high, which shoulder is too low. Her pelvis is level, her hands are by her side. Um, she looks in pretty good alignment from the front. From the side, her, head, her ear is over her shoulder, her shoulder is over her elbow, her hand is lined up with the side of her leg, her pelvis has a slight anterior tilt. Those are the kind of things, and you just get used to eyeballing them. And then if you look at the back, you can see once again, um, her elbows are pointed backwards, her uh, pelvis is level, her hands are where they belong. She actually, uh, both of her upper traps are a little bit elongated, but that's, that's really a minor point in her. Well, look, let's look at somebody with minor, with uh, major um, postural malalignment. Um, his head is uh, pretty far forward. His ear is way, before, way in front of his shoulder. He's got big, long arms, which you'll see in a lot of your athletes, especially swimmers and, and pitchers. Um, but his, his pelvis is tilted. He's got lumbar lordosis, thoracic kyphosis. His uh, scapula is anteriorly tilted. His hands are in front of what would be the seam of his, his pants. He's got some lower extremity malalignment as well. But not, not that you harp on this, but just get an idea that if you, you have to look at, at the uh, total alignment. Well, how about this picture? You look at him from the front. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, you look at him from the front, and his right shoulder is drooped. And you know that because this clavicle is at the right angle. His right nipple is too low. That's looking at him from the front. If you look at him from the back, his pelvis is tilted. His right hand is way out in front and out to the side because his rotator cuff and his deltoid were too tight. But his scapula is too low. And I want, when we get to the rehab portion of the talk, I want you to think about, uh, my pointer just died. Uh, okay. Um, I, I want you to think about his shoulder and that you would not rehab this the way you would rehab somebody who has an elevated shoulder. Thank you. Well, let's move down. Here's a, here's a kid that got drafted originally in the sixth round of the major league draft. He throws the ball at 94 miles an hour and he's right-handed. So you have him stand on his right leg and do a single leg squat. Incredible lumbo-pelvic weakness as his leg wobbled coming down, but look at his right shoulder. So if he stands on his right leg to throw, his compensation for the lumbo-pelvic instability is the fact that his shoulder has to drop. And he had an incredible amount of pathology in his shoulder, and it's remarkable that he threw at 94 miles an hour. He was rehabbed, actually, and then just went in the third round of the draft the following year and is, is now pitching triple-A ball. Well, Giovanni talked a little bit about scapular position uh, and anterior tilting of the scapula. And the major culprit in this, in my experience, is uh, pec minor tightness or shortness. Um, that causes an anterior tilt, which really closes off the, uh, the subacromial space. So let's take this young man who we had uh, one of our um, physical therapists, and we asked him to elevate his arm. And this is about, oops, I apologize for that. Um, and this is about where he got, but just by elevating his chest. I just asked him to bring his chest up. And by bringing your chest up, doing a sternal lift, what you do is you put your thoracic spine into extension, which causes your scapula to drop back and down. So he gets more motion. And then I asked him to show me what he's got and give me a little bit more, and he was able to get up higher but the body links together. So in order to get up higher, he had to drop his chin, and he has cervical spine problems, and he also has low back problems, and that's evidenced by the lordosis that he goes into. So in order to get your shoulder in position, your whole body is involved. So how do we evaluate pec minor tightness? Well, you put them on the back, and on the left side, this young man is in pretty good shape. But on the right, look what happens. In order to get his scapula down, his arm pops up. 
Now, we were able to get his shoulder down by pushing and push on his hand.